Welcome everybody. This is Ryan Hoime, aka Massage Nerd. And tonight we have a special guest. His name is Michael Reynolds. He is the president and CEO of SpinWeb, a professional website de um, design development online marketing firm. Michael has worked in the marketing and technology since 1996 and serves on a number of nonprofit and networking organization boards. Michael regularly, pu regularly publishes email articles, blogs, and ebooks that teach, um, teach his readers how to do business and communicate using digital tools. He also speaks at industry events around the country, including the Web 2.0 Expo in New York, the CMS Expo in Chicago, and the blog Indiana in Indianapolis. Michael plays tennis, loves all things Apple, and would do just about um, anything for good sushi. Michael can be contacted by a speaking site at www.michaelreynolds.com or via SpinWeb website at www.spinweb.net. Welcome tonight, Michael. Good evening, Ryan. Thanks, Thanks for having me. No, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'm very excited about this because, again, I, I love, um, I, I do my own website, but I want to get tips too. So <laughs> it's not all about my viewers tonight too. So. <laughs> So you're huge into blogging. So what got you involved into blogging? Um, I've always enjoyed writing. Um, writing is something that kind of comes naturally to me and is a lot of fun for me. Uh, my mother is an English professor, probably has something to do with that. So uh, it's always been kind of fun for me. And writing is a just a natural way to uh, kind of combine creative writing with the world of business and marketing. So it's just kind of a logical uh, juxtaposition of, of uh, what I enjoy doing. Um, once you get in a groove in blogging, um, it becomes a lot more fun because you start to see the payoff. You start to see the payoff in terms of search engine benefits, uh, social proof benefits, content marketing. Uh, so once you see results in blogging, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to kind of keep the, the momentum going as well. So it's just fun for me. Yeah. So, but there is some work involved in it, isn't it? Yeah, quite a bit of work. Uh, blogging is hard. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, even for, for people that enjoy writing. Um, so, you know, I'm very honest about the fact that, you know, blogging is something difficult you have to really work at. Uh, but again, once you get the momentum going, um, it's a lot easier. But uh, I, I often advise people to generate a system for blogging. And, uh, you know, there's some ways you can, uh, you know, create systems and processes that make it a lot easier. And do you believe that um, when people are blogging, do you think WordPress is a good way to go if you're um, not technically knowledgeable um, in the making websites? Mm -hmm. Yeah, WordPress is a great platform. Um, it works very well for small businesses, for individuals who have a blog. My own personal uh, blog is on WordPress. It works great. Um, we kind of see both. A lot of times if we're working with a larger company, uh, you know, we see that WordPress isn't quite as scalable. And so we'll use a different CMS. Uh, in fact, my company focuses exclusively on, on a different CMS. We don't use WordPress uh, for our clients. But uh, in a kind of personal context, I've used WordPress many times, and it works great. And I've seen a lot of uh, massage therapists and small businesses use WordPress and make really nice-looking sites. So I fully endorse it. It works great. And, I mean, so a lot of people are scared of kind of divulging their information out to the web. Um, how, how do you get beyond that, would you say? Because, again, some people are just scared of um, giving themselves to other people and stuff, but they want to get their content out there. Uh, when you say scared of divulging information on the web, referring to like on social networks or on social media, they, they kind of are afraid to uh, put themselves out there and fill out profiles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you referring? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that kind of reminds me of a blog I wrote a while back. I forget the title, but it kind of made the analogy of uh, photos in your home. You know, you're not going to necessarily uh, place all of your personal family photos on the outside of your house. You're going to, you know, decide what you want to show your friends and neighbors and what you don't. Um, same thing with social media. Um, just because you create a profile or create uh, some sort of presence online doesn't automatically mean the whole world has access to your whole life. It means you can decide what you put out there. So when I find people that are kind of scared of that and a little apprehensive about uh, maybe using Facebook for marketing, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, communicating on these tools, you know, I just say, you know what, um, you can control what you put out there. So uh, just be mindful of where that balance point lies between personal and business and find out what works for you. And what kind of things do people, what do you, what kind of people, uh, what kind of things do you see people doing wrong in blogging? Um, I see a lot of um, broadcast marketing and blogging. 
Uh, blogging is content marketing primarily, which means it's a more subtle um, expertise kind of demonstration platform. Uh, what a lot of people do, I've noticed, is they start blogging, they basically make it a commercial. Uh, they talk all about themselves, their product, their company, and it's all about them. It's all basically a big promotion. And few things turn people off faster than trying, being sold when they're reading a blog. Uh, people really have no tolerance for that. They're not going to come back. They're not going to subscribe. They don't really get value. Instead, uh, good blogging really revolves around focusing on your constituents and giving them valuable information that is useful to them and asking nothing in return. And it seems kind of productive to a lot of what, um, a lot of what people think marketing really is, but uh, content marketing really focuses on giving lots of value to your constituents so that they develop a sense of trust with you. And that trust then later turns into uh, permission to have a conversation, perhaps permission to be a prospect, and then permission to be a customer. That's a great analogy because the thing is so many people, I see so many people, it's just like buy now, buy now kind of thing. I mean, it's like car salesmen almost, you know. <laughs> I would like that. <laughs> but, but they do get some business just because sometimes people get scared, though. That's a problem. So, but, yeah. 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 Yep, and and with um, blogging too, what what about if you're not a really good writer too? And um, is there any kind of information out there that it can help you get better at writing? Um, yeah, there's a few things you can do. One is you can hire a ghost blogger. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people say, you know what, I'm not a great writer, or I don't have time, or I don't like to write, so I'm going to pay someone to blog for me. And what they do is they will conduct uh, maybe monthly interviews. And uh, if you're having someone ghost blog for you. Uh, you can give them talking points, give them uh, concepts about your business, give them knowledge you have, and they can then turn that into a blog and publish it for you in your voice. Um, and that's, um, that works very well for people that necessarily don't have an affinity or an interest in writing. Uh, if you do want to get better at writing, um, I think practice is probably one of the best ways. There are lots of resources online about um, you know, blogging etiquette, uh, how to write, uh, grammar tips, things like that. Um, you know, get a friend who's good at writing and uh, pop it in a Google Doc and send it over. Um, you know, buy your friend dinner to have them edit your Google Doc for you and polish it up. You know, there's lots of creative ways you can start off a concept and then have someone else help you polish it up, and you'll gradually start to see um, how to how to create that content yourself. I think. Oh, that's that's great advice. And um, with with blogging too, what, for let's say for domain names, I mean. How do people come up with their domain names, and what's better? Is it better to have a .com or .net or what, what, what's or .org? Or? Um, it doesn't matter so much anymore, I think. Uh, .com is still the standard. Uh, most people still think of .com. So even if you say, you know, my blog is at, you know, blah.net or blah.org or something, a lot of people are still going to type .com just because they don't necessarily know any better. So it's good to get a .com if you can. But um, in general, it's not quite as important because a lot of people are going to find your blog through search, through links, other places. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, there's some new domains out like .co. Uh, I see some .uses every now and then. Um, again, it's not critically important, but if you can get a .com, that's my favorite. That's still still the standard. Okay. <laughs> and Laura Allen just um, chimed in. She says she's only up because of you. <laughs> hey, Laura. <laughs> I'm on the East Coast, and it's 10 p.m. here as well, so I'm, uh, uh, it's, it's late over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with um, SEO, what is actually SEO for the average person? Uh, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization, and uh, the gist of it is in plain English is it's the practice of fine-tuning your content and your presence on the Internet uh, to be found when people search on uh, search engines for certain keywords that align with what you do. So um, kind of a, a, an example would be if you're a massage therapist and you live in Indianapolis like I do and you specialize in Thai massage. If someone goes online to Google, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, and types in uh, Thai massage in Indianapolis, um, it behooves you to be on the first page, preferably number one. So SEO is the practice of tuning your website so that Google indexes it and ranks it as uh, one of the top um, results that appear when someone searches on that search term. Okay. And then, I mean, back in the day, people are so gung-ho on keywords. Are keywords still a factor, would you say? They are. They're a huge factor. Um, there's lots of ways you can tune your content on your site uh, to rank very well for SEO. 
Uh, that's one of the factors. Inbound linking is also extremely important. Um, the more you get uh, properly formatted links from other websites that point to you, uh, the more that's going to help you in SEO. Uh, and there's lots of ways that um, you can kind of encourage those linkings. Uh, for example, if you um, ask other sites to link to you and then use anchor text that uh, has keywords in it that align with what you do, Google sees that as a vote. So, for example, if you have your local newspaper uh, write a press release on your grand opening for your new location or something, and they link the words Thai massage in Indianapolis to your website, Google sees that as a vote for the words Thai massage in Indianapolis pointing to your website. So that's one vote in your favor. That's kind of one um, out of lots and lots of techniques. That's one uh, technique that, uh, that's important. Okay. And then descriptions and title, are those um, still important too? Uh, the title is the most important. Description, um, a little bit. Uh, meta tags, Google, I've seen. Um, Google employees basically say we don't use meta tags anymore. Um, so Google pretty much says they don't worry about it. Um, it's still good because um, the description is kind of a conversion tool. So when someone searches and you show up in a listing, the description is going to show up and, and display what the content's about, which can encourage click-throughs. Um, so that kind of stuff is, is a little bit important, but the title tag is the most important. Uh, when you're blogging, uh, whatever you put in the title is going to be of critical importance. So uh, if you're blogging about uh, a particular topic, you want to front load your title tag with as many of those keywords as, as, you, as you can. Well, as many, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that because you don't want to stuff it too much, but you want to put your, your proper keywords that you're ranking for in the front of that title because that's what Google's really going to look at and, um, and index. And should people use commas at all or just, I mean, because on YouTube you don't need commas at all. So you just enter the words as long as there is space. Um, but you can, you can never double up your words when you're submitting a video for the keywords. Uh, are you referring to the tags? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it depends on your system. Uh, some content management systems will require you to separate keywords and phrases by comma. Uh, some won't. It just depends. Uh, WordPress, I believe, does use commas. Uh, actually, it's got a built-in system that kind of automatically... Uh, formats it for you. And I heard with a WordPress, sometimes they're not as good, um, not SEO friendly enough. Is that true, or do you have to have certain plugins to help that out then? Or uh, WordPress is pretty good for SEO out of the box. Um, it uh, you want to make sure you turn on uh, human readable URLs, which means uh, instead of like question marks and you know strange characters in the URL, you're actually going to have keywords like uh, slash domain slash blog slash title words in there. Um, so that's what you want to do. And there is a plugin called the All-in-One SEO Pack uh, that I would recommend enabling. It lets you format your window title and your tags and things a little bit better. And also a good service to subscribe to and plug in to WordPress is called Scribe. And it's at scribeseo.com. That's S-C-R-I-B-E-S-E-O.com. And it's like, I think, 20 bucks a month for the lowest package. And uh, it will let you automatically analyze your content for search and it will make suggestions for you, and it will tell you what to change to make your content as search friendly as possible. Okay. And then I know there's some uh, websites out there that will say, well, we'll get you on top of um, the front page of Google if you pay us so much money. Do those things mm -hmm. actually work? 99% of them are scam, honestly. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's just kind of what I've seen. Um, there are some really, really good, valid um professional SEO companies. We have a partner here in Indianapolis that we refer to that, uh, you know, they charge a lot of money, but they get really good results. Um, so there are companies that are really good at SEO, and they're very uh, above board, very professional, uh, very ethical, and they produce really good results. Um, look for companies like that. If you work with, a, or if you look at a company and they're basically saying, hey, pay us um, $200 and we'll index you in all these millions of search engines, and it's a one-shot deal, uh, don't waste your money. SEO is not a one-time project. SEO is an ongoing process. Okay. And then somebody in the chat asked, what is technically involved in, in placing a blog on your website? Um, it's going to depend on your platform. It's a great question. Um, most modern websites run on what's called a CMS, which stands for Content Management System. Uh, a good CMS will have a blog plugin. Uh, WordPress, by default, is kind of a, a blog in itself, so you don't really have to put it on your site. It's kind of built in. Um, so whatever CMS you're using, if the, if the person that uh, asked the question wants to tell me what CMS they're using, I can be more detailed. But most CMSs have a plugin you can just turn on, and then you've got a blog you can place on your site somewhere. Okay. 
And then um, Steph um, asked, GoDaddy.com has SEO analysis, diagnostics built in that you can add. It limits the keywords at 14 to 15 um, per page. Is it considered bad form? Do you add more than that if it relates to the content? Um, there are so many answers to that question depending on what depth. <laughs> it's hard to, <laughs> hard to go too in depth. Um, I personally wouldn't trust GoDaddy to do a whole lot for my SEO. Uh, I think they're a great domain registrar and they probably do hosting pretty well. Um, I've not used their SEO service though, uh, so I can't really talk about it too much. Um, but I do know that it's very difficult to rank for a whole lot of keywords on one piece of content. The more keywords you try to rank for, the more diluted it's going to get. So it generally behooves you to uh, narrow it down as much as possible and find those specific niche keywords. Um, they're kind of called long tail keywords sometimes, which means, you know, for us, example, uh, for example, my company does web design. You know, we're not going to rank for web design. There's just so much competition nationally. Um, it's just not going to happen. And even if we did, we'd get lots of different uh, types of traffic. We'd get people, you know, doing research projects, maybe students on web design, people looking for jobs in web design, uh, random articles. So instead, uh, it behooves us to rank more for long tail keywords that are kind of more out in this niche area, uh, like um, nonprofit web design, for example, or uh, manufacturing company web design, things that uh, vertical markets we work in. So the more specific you can get, um, the more likely you are to rank in the com competition that's out there and the more likely you are to get in front of actual buyers instead of tire kickers or, or just traffic that's not really a customer. Okay. And then um, what about, um, let's see, XHTML and HTML and CMS. What's the difference between those? Um, HTML and CSS is just the language of the web. Uh, it's the markup that um, websites are, are written in. It was what renders web pages. Um, CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And so the style sheet is sort of the, um, the formatting layer, if you will, of the web content. The uh, HT, or, I'm sorry, HTML portion is the uh, kind of the structural part. So the structural part basically tells you where to put containers of content, and the CSS tells you what those content pieces look like. Okay. I'm using my hands to wave around as if that helps you. <laughs> Typical massage therapist. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And what about PHP? I mean, I, I don't see too much of that out there. Is there still a lot out there? Um, yeah, PHP um, is a programming language, very popular. Um, and yeah, um, PHP is a, a very strong community. It's uh, very widely used. The content management system that we use is written in PHP. Uh, WordPress is written in PHP as well. Um, so the average person is never going to have to worry about it because that's kind of developer territory and they write code and you know make these magic widgets that do things and we just magically accept that. Um, <laughs> so most people would never have to worry about it. Uh, most people are going to just um, get a good CMS, whether it's WordPress, whether it's something else. Um, and they're going to deploy a site on that CMS and never have to see code. Okay. Or they're going to ideally hire a company to build it for them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Which is what I recommend, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Spinweb.net. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I, I know when I first made my website uh, a little over five years ago, my one of my pages kept coming up number one um, for Google when searching for massage pictures. It kept coming up number one. I had some pictures on there, and I didn't even know about keywords. I didn't even have keywords, no description, hardly any words. But my title—that's the only thing I had. So, the, does that speak speak to that then, or? Yeah, every now and then you'll do something by accident. Um, I can. I've uh, written some blogs, and some employees at my company have written some blogs that were just kind of fun blogs about nothing in particular related to, you know, trying to market. And we get ranked for stuff that we just didn't even realize. Like we use a project management system called Basecamp. And my project manager, uh, he's kind of a productivity hobbyist, and he wrote a, a blog about um, how to configure Basecamp for productivity in your company, just kind of sharing what we learned. He posted it. A week later, um, if you search on the phrase Basecamp tips, uh, we rank on page one for that, and we get a ton of traffic, and we actually got a lead from it. So every now and then stuff can happen by accident, which is nice. <laughs> and to be a good blogger, would you say you would have to blog each day, or is there a certain kind of time frame you should start putting content out? Um, as often as possible. That's kind of the general rule. Um, 
I know some people that blog every day, and I think they're insane, but I admire them. Um, I tend to blog once a week on my company site, and on my personal site, I blog whenever I feel like it. Um, so sometimes it's a few times a week, sometimes it's once a month, kind of depending on that. It's my personal site. But on my business site, uh, spinweb.net, uh, I'm very systematic, and every Monday I publish a new blog, and that's part of my marketing system. So I go through my steps and say, you know, every week I publish a blog, I distribute it in this schedule, I publish on these networks, I do this activity, X, Y, and Z. So it's part of my system. So I think once a week is a great goal to shoot for, and you can see um, good results uh, by publishing once a week. And do you see people doing vlogs at all much? I mean, so video blogs? Oh, video? Um, sometimes. Uh, one of my favorite uh, blogs to subscribe to is Jeffrey Gittimer. He's a, a sales professional. He speaks and writes books. And he's starting to, uh, to do video blogging. It's kind of fun, little two-minute excerpts on you know, sales tips, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I don't see a whole lot of it yet. I think a lot of people are still you know, not quite as comfortable getting in front of a camera and talking uh, as they are writing. Uh, I'm one of them. I'd rather write than get in front of a camera and try to say something, you know, uh, profound and meaningful. So yeah, I'm, I'm more a writer personally. Um, but if you're comfortable making video and you can do it consistently, uh, I think a lot of people like that. Okay. And then um, what, what about the social medias? I mean, is it really all the hype? All the hype? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just did. Great kids in their social media and their internet. Um, <laughs> I think it's a... Uh, it's a balance of, uh, or kind of a mixture rather, uh, of hype and productivity. And I think we're still kind of figuring it out. Um, I forget where I saw this, but um, there's a graph I saw recently where it basically takes new technology and then um, I'm going to try to do this backwards so people on camera can see it the way it's supposed to be. Um, this is the kind of, you know, the new technology graph says, okay, early adopters, they go crazy. Here's a bunch of hype. Here's the height of the hype. And then people get tired of it and give up and say, oh, it's silly, and it goes down. And then people start realizing how productive it is, and they start uh, using technology in more practical ways, and you kind of go up and level off. And so social media, uh, a lot of people think social media is kind of um, in that slump where the hype is dying down. And then soon we're kind of getting into this um, you know, higher uh, gradual growth in terms of uh, practical usage. That's kind of a long maybe – boring answer to your question, but uh, I think that's where I would see social media. A lot of practical uses for, uh, for social media, um, but I think there's still a lot of people that haven't quite figured out how to adapt it to their business model. Okay. And um, with, with Facebook, what's the big difference between groups and fan pages? Ah, uh, groups, uh, I don't see a whole lot of groups anymore. Uh, groups are really designed just for a, uh, a loosely organized common interest group, like a social club or like a cause, or like a church group or something. Uh, they were great for that. Uh, the vast majority of organizations should have a fan page, though. Um, anything with a logo, a, an entity name, uh, any kind of uh, organized structure generally should have a fan page. Okay. Uh, and fan page is more like a business listing or a business landing page on Facebook. And are group pages uh, actually indexed at all or not? Uh, no, unless something's changed. Uh, groups aren't indexed on uh, Google, but fan pages are. Okay. And then um, Steph asked the question, other than fan page channel, what other outlets do you recommend to ensure clients' communities um, see what's happening within your business? Uh, good question. Uh, I assume this is uh, specific to a massage business. Yep. Uh, I'm a big fan of Twitter, personally, and LinkedIn, kind of the big three, or Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, I think it just depends on who you are, personality-wise, as well. Um, as far as channels, uh, a lot of massage therapists uh, really like Facebook, and Facebook is a very personal kind of network, so I see a lot of massage therapists uh, successfully engaging with people on Facebook. Um, I also am a big fan of Twitter because um, it appeals to my short attention span and kind of my, you know, next shiny thing uh, syndrome where I like to try lots of different things and have all these different conversations going. So. Twitter is a fun tool to do research as well. You can put a question out on Twitter or do searches on Twitter to find people looking for certain things. And you can engage in conversations uh, based on those keyword searches very quickly and easily. Um, a lot of people still don't get Twitter, but, uh, but it's worth a look. Um, I also like LinkedIn a lot, and a lot of people are getting more into LinkedIn because, um, well, it's just gaining in popularity, but it's a really good way to 
uh, endorse, or no, I guess not endorse, but uh, demonstrate your credibility and your expertise. You can import your blog. You can get lots of recommendations from clients. Uh, you can make connections with clients. Um, so it's kind of a virtual uh, CRM, kind of a cloud-based CRM that you can uh, use to track your contacts as well. So uh, I like using LinkedIn uh, for business connections as well. But really, I love blogging as the foundation. Um, without blogging, you've got a decent chance of making good connections and nurturing relationships. But with a blog, you've got a much stronger foundation of good content that consistently demonstrates your expertise. And again, every piece of content that you produce that's knowledgeable, that's valuable, that teaches somebody something, uh, that's one more notch in your favor uh, toward demonstrating your expertise and strengthening trust between you and your constituents. So blogging is a really good foundation for everything you do in social media, in my opinion. Okay. And then, and then um, what are some Facebook etiquette then? Uh, Facebook etiquette. Uh, I hope Alyssa's out there listening because she and I soapbox about this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I see it all the time too. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, think, um, I think our biggest pet peeve, Alyssa and I, is, um, or one of them is uh, businesses using Facebook profiles as a business. Uh, we get real peeved about that. <laughs> and I see a lot of times people will, um, they'll set up a personal profile, but they'll call it, you know, business XYZ or, or whatever, and, and they'll put their logo in place of the photo. And they'll make friend requests. And my personal policy now is I just don't accept them. Sometimes I'll write a polite note explaining the difference. But, you know, it's against Facebook's terms of service to do that. It's just impolite. It's just awkward. Um, so I don't like to see that. A business should be a fan page. Um, a Facebook profile should have your photo. It should have your name. It should tell about you. Um, I'm also a stickler for people that put pictures of flowers or pictures of the beach or pictures of their dog in their profile photo slot. I, I just don't like to see that. Maybe I'm, you know, kind of fuddy-duddy, but I just like to see a photo and a real person uh, because it's a personal communication medium, and it makes a difference. I mean, if I'm looking at someone and it's a picture of their dog, I, I feel kind of a distance there. I feel there's a wall between us. I don't really feel quite as, as tight a connection as I do with someone with a nice smiling photo that looks like a real person. Um, also, uh, I recommend if you're going to friend someone on Facebook and you don't, you know that um, you don't necessarily have a, a real strong personal connection, maybe you've never met in person before, um, I think you should always write a personal note that says, hey, um, I'm friending you because X, Y, Z. I think, you know, I like what you, uh, what, you, what you publish. We've met, you know, way back when or, you know, we're in the same group together, whatever it is. Uh, when someone friends me without a, a message, I don't know who it is, I always write back and say, hey, thanks for the request, but if you could tell me a little bit about yourself before I accept, I'd appreciate it. I'd just like to you know, get a bit more information. So those are a few of my soapboxes on Facebook etiquette. Um, if anyone else has any others, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what, what, what's, the best, what's the easiest way to get fans for your fan page? Uh, produce good content. Um, that's my, my favorite way. Um, a lot of people will continuously, uh, send out requests and kind of spam people by saying, Hey, like my fan page, like my fan page, like my fan page. And suddenly you're like, Oh my gosh, I don't want to hear about your fan page ever again. So <laughs> uh, you send one message out that says, Hey, like my fan page. If you want, have fun. And then after that, um, produce really good content that you post on that fan page so that people will start to share it for you and uh, people will start to endorse your content for you and, and that will be the, the best way of getting uh, fans, I believe. It's, it's a slower process, but it's less annoying to people and it, uh, it's a more credible way of building fans, in my opinion. Okay. And then what about, um, what is that, is it Foursquare or something like that where you, you get let um, other people know where you're actually at? Yeah, the stalker app? Yep. <laughs> I love Foursquare. I think it's a lot of fun. Some people think it's really creepy. It is kind of creepy, but whatever. Um, I I think retail businesses and uh, personal services, um, you know, healthcare offices, uh, massage therapists can really use Foursquare in a big way, and really no one's doing it. Um, Foursquare lets you, uh, first of all, if you're a consumer, you can check in at places using your phone. So on my iPhone, um, I'm not sure if the camera will pick up the app, but I'll, uh, I'll give it a shot. Um, I'm loading up Foursquare here. I'm not sure if you can see it, but um, I can go to places and it will automatically sense where I am based on uh, GPS. 
and it will let me check into places. So for example, if I go to my massage therapist, my massage therapist, if they have a listing on Foursquare, will show up in the list. I can click check in and it will then um, check me into that location uh, via Foursquare. I can publish that to my Twitter or my Facebook feed so other people can see it with a link to the address listing. And, um, and so it's a kind of a fun way of seeing if you're at the same location as someone else uh, in your friend list. But going a step beyond, businesses can use it in a really big way for in a couple ways. One, uh, if you go create a Foursquare listing and claim your page and kind of modify it and then fill it out, you can put uh, information about your business, you can put your, a link to your website, so when someone checks in, it can broadcast a link to your website via Twitter and Facebook. So when they check in, they're marketing for you for free, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> the other thing you can do is you can actually create specials. So for example, you, if someone checks in at your location maybe two or three times uh, on the third check-in, you can offer them a, a free gift certificate or a free product or a free something or other. And so you're encouraging people to come back and check in which means that um, because we're giving them an incentive to do so. So it makes a fun little game out of it. It helps market your business and uh, it really just kind of um, attaches the, your constituents to your business in a little bit tighter way, generates a little bit more uh, loyalty in a fun kind of way. So um, I love to see massage therapists using Foursquare more by creating specials, um, rewarding frequent customers, uh, stuff like that. It works, uh, works really well. And how do you draw the line with um, massage clients and Facebook? Massage clients and Facebook. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, like if you're a massage therapist and you friend your clients on Facebook, yeah. how, do you, how do you manage that? Uh, good question. Um, I think it's going to be different for each person. Um, I personally am not real big on making a bunch of different lists. I just kind of say, you know, I have this balance point of personal, professional, everywhere, and I just kind of do that. Um, but I know some people that create a separate list for their clients on Facebook and they will put their clients in that list and they'll go to that list periodically and they'll kind of see what life events are happening um, based on what their clients are posting and that will give them an opportunity to say, oh, congratulations on your new baby or you're pregnant, you know, blah, blah, or you bought a new home or something. And they can, you know, maybe send a little gift or send a little congratulations note or something and, you know, in a subtle way, stay top of mind. Nothing wrong with that. Um, they can also set privacy settings. So if you want to put people in a certain list and ensure that those people see only a certain uh, level of information and then maybe your uh, other friends that are kind of in a more personal context can see more personal stuff, you can also separate that way. So it's really up to you, but Facebook lets you make that separation. And I've heard of people even getting fired for comments they make on their Facebook uh, profile yeah. about their businesses too and stuff. And do you think that's going to be more of a trend too? Um, I think so. I did read an article recently that uh, kind of overruled that. They said, um, I forget exactly the details of it, but there was an employee um, that did post something negative about uh, their company, but it was on off hours. They weren't on the clock, so to speak, um, but they got fired. But then when they appealed it, um, I forget which court, but they, they appealed it and it got, uh, it ruled in favor of the employee. Um, I'm not sure if that's a one-off situation, but, you know, Indiana, for example, is a, an at-will employment state, so you can basically fire people for no reason, and that's okay. Um, so I think a lot of companies are still going to you know, look at that and say, you know what, I'm, I don't like what that person's posting on Facebook, I'm going to fire them for it, and probably can't do much about it. So I think the general rule is just be sensible in life and be a, a decent person, and you're probably good to go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I wouldn't post um, too much negative stuff on Facebook that I wouldn't say in person in real life. If you kind of use that general rule of thumb, and just know when to be diplomatic and know when something you say is productive or when it's not and just kind of use common sense, you're probably fine. Did you read that thing about the teacher the, a few days ago or she was commenting about her students? No, I didn't see that. Yeah, and then she got, um, she got put on leave too and stuff. So that just, that just happened a few days ago. And she was blogging. Here? Yeah, she was, no, I think it was here. She was blogging about it too. And, so. No, I didn't see that one. I saw something in Europe that was similar, but I didn't see that one. Yep. And then somebody in the um, chat asked, so they, they can't figure out RSS and what actually is it? Mm -hmm. RSS. Um, RSS stands for really simple syndication, which is ironic because no one gets it because it's kind of strange. Um, <laughs> it's, it, um, thing, yeah. <laughs> it's basically a, a data stream of content that you can subscribe to in different formats. So let's say your blog is here. Again, I'm waving my hands as if this helps you. Um, <laughs> got my blog here. And my RSS feed is a little piece of it here that will basically 
uh, allow my content to get kind of published in this little um, data stream. And people can have what's called RSS readers, which is a piece of software, or Google has one as well, that lets you subscribe to it. So whenever a new blog gets published, that new article is going to get pushed out to that data stream, and then your RSS reader will pick it up and pop it into view so you can read it. It also lets you take that content and syndicate it on different sites. So, for example, if you've got an RSS feed on your website, I can take that RSS feed and drop in some code on my website that will take your articles and publish them on my site as well. So whenever you update your site, it updates mine with that same content. So RSS is simply a way to... Again, just create a data stream of content that you can push out to different sources or embed on different places as well. Okay. And then okay. do you think that whole um, like button on people's website, do you think that helps um, get their traffic up too? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, the Facebook like button is, uh, is pretty cool. I mean, it's a really easy way to let people give you a quick thumbs up. And what it does is, uh, you know, when they click like, um, it will send a link back to their Facebook feed so that everyone in their Facebook feed can see that they liked that piece of content and it will include the title so they can click on that title and link back over to your website. So it's a great way to let people uh, publish or uh, promote your content for you for free. Okay. And do you think um, RSS, do you think that's um, caught on to the average public at all or not? Uh, no. I don't. I'm not sure it will. Um, I think it's got its uses, and I think it's really useful in a lot of ways, but um, it requires people to uh, decide how they're going to consume it, which means they're going to have to uh, download a piece of software or set up their Google Reader or do something uh, actionable on their part, and that's always a barrier to adopting technology. So I say it's probably going to remain um, kind of a niche thing where people that get RSS are going to use it. People that don't probably aren't going to miss it. So. And do you think it's better to have a separate um, blog, so a separate domain, or do you think it's better to have a, um, a blog in your website? Uh, this is always a controversial topic. So uh, <laughs> two ex ten SEO experts about it, five will say one thing and five will say the other. Just ahead. Um, I, um, I think it's better to have the blog under your main domain name because then it um, keeps all of the benefit um, – all, all of the uh, the power of your blog and SEO benefits along with your domain name. It, it, it uh, attaches to your domain. So I prefer to see it under your domain. Um, I have talked to SEO experts, including our partner company we work with here in India that agrees that you should have it under your domain name. So that's my preference. I have heard some people say um, it's better to host it externally. Um, again, part of some of SEO is just mysterious voodoo that some people just don't know the, the final word and and uh, again, I personally like to see it under the domain name. And what is an actual catch? I'm sorry? A, a catch. Um, so for like blogs and stuff, so they're catching information and stuff. So it's because I had to install, uh, it's called the super catch on my um, WordPress blog. A catch? Yeah. Uh, you're referring like a CAPTCHA on a form that you fill out? No, it, yeah, right. uh, it's C A C H E, I think it's. Oh, a catch. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, in what context? Um, where did you see that? No, um, I, I, I had um, my, the person I um, host my website through um, actually um, sh shut my website down because I was getting too much traffic or something. Uh, really? So, yeah. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is, I had to uh, install, uh, install that and stuff like that in order to slow things down a little bit. And, um, caching refers to taking data and, uh, well, let me blow it back up a little bit. Uh, most modern websites are built on a content management system which is database driven. What that means is when someone goes to your website and requests content, um, the browser uh, goes to the web server, the code on the web server goes to the database, again, where hand waving helps, right? Um, goes to the database and it retrieves uh, content from the database, pulls it out. Uh, which causes the disk to spin, it causes the processor to run, it causes some load on the web server. Uh, normally that's fine. Um, but if you get enough traffic, you get lots of database activity, lots of processing happens, um, it can bog down the server. What caching does is caching will take um, queries from the, to the database and it will basically export that into just a raw kind of piece of data in a flat file format or some kind of uh, static format that's really easy to just grab and pull out. And it will um, allow you to then hit that cached version instead of in the database. So it will lighten the load on the web server. Okay. A little bit of a geeky answer, but I hope that kind of gives <laughs> <you. laughs>
<laughs> and then somebody in the chat asks, uh, what's your opinion on event marketing on Facebook? Is it better, better off going with RSVP email blast or do you find the Facebook's version uh, reliable? Um, I think Facebook's version works fine. Um, honestly, I'm really burned out on all the event invitations I get on Facebook. <laughs> it's almost too easy, I think. So everyone and their cat is sending me invitations to things on Facebook. And um, anymore, I just basically just kind of ignore them all because it's so easy for people to do that I get so much of this. So um, I think it works fine, but I, I encourage people to be selective. Um, if you're going to market an event on Facebook and use the built-in event system, you know, be selective about who you're inviting. Make sure you really target people that you think are good prospects and don't just kind of, you know, blanket invite everyone on your list. That'll kind of get old. Um, but the RSVP system does work well. It does let you track attendees. So if it's a free event, um, I think it works fine. Uh, but again, email also works great. So I wouldn't really put all my eggs in one basket. Um, one of the reasons we are, um, you know, we have lots of lead sources at SpinWeb, and you know, we don't do just one thing. We do lots of things. We do blogging a lot. Um, we do uh, networking in person. We do uh, some Facebook activity. We do a lot of Twitter activity. Um, I make LinkedIn connections, I tune in my LinkedIn profile for SEO, um, I do speaking, uh, we're starting a podcast, um, we do email marketing, we do lots of different things. And so by doing, uh, by having lots of different permission marketing channels, you can tie all that together and you can also hit a, a broader spectrum of people as opposed to just kind of putting all your eggs in like, you know, a Facebook basket or an email basket or whatever. You want to kind of diversify and see what works best for you. And with email marketing, do you think that's um, becoming a thing of the past some? I mean, it seemed like back in the day it was, it was huge and stuff. Is, is it still that way? or? Uh, there's a joke going around in the marketing community that uh, email is dead, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, kind of has this battle cry, email is dead because of Facebook. And um, actually, um, one of the largest and most uh, successful email marketing companies is here in India. They're called Exact Target. Um, and they are uh, just growing exponentially, and they're seeing incredible growth in the email marketing segment. Um, most people still see email as their primary communication source. Um, I've seen also studies from uh, Jacob Nielsen, who's a prominent usability expert, um, who did a study on social media and young people, basically college students, and his study basically proved that young people use Facebook for personal stuff, but they don't want to do business on Facebook. When they want to do business, they're going to go to a company's website and they're going to use email. So there's kind of this misconception out there that you know everyone's on Facebook and everyone under 30 is always on Facebook and they ignore email and you know we have to just jump on that bandwagon. Um, I don't think that's the case, and the data is showing that's not the case. Um, email is is a really strong, really viable way to communicate and to market if it's done correctly. Okay, and then somebody um, asked about a, a blog question. So if you have a blog on your site, um, do you need to subscribe to a, a CMS? Um, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, you can do a blog without a CMS, but it's a pain. Um, any good CMS is going to have blog functionality. Again, WordPress is probably the, the least, path of least resistance is really to set up. Um, it's basically a whole blog in itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, to really seriously blog, you need to do CMS, unless you're going to do something like uh, going to Blogspot or something like that, which I'm not a big fan of, but um, it's a kind of a CMS in itself. Okay. And, and how do um, companies like Twitter, I mean, you don't see any ads, how do they make, make money? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they, I, I've seen some indications that they're starting a, a paid model, um, creating business accounts that will have more functionality. And then businesses will be able to subscribe uh, to a business level account. They can do more stuff. They can do more uh, data tracking and more research. Um, I have heard of that coming, but I, I don't. I uh, haven't seen any indication of it yet. Um, I think uh, from what I've seen, Twitter is basically just funded on you know venture capital until they get to a certain point, and they're going to get bought by someone like Google, or they're going to create a business model based on their incredibly large user base. Okay, and then. Um, what is this thing with Facebook? Uh, aren't they trying to um, intertwine um, chat and email and everything into one? Yeah, Facebook seems to be trying to take over the world. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I haven't seen um, a whole lot about it yet. I mean, I see the, the big hullabaloo now with the whole, every time Facebook changes the user interface, everyone's up in arms. And so the fan page changed. 
it's got a lot of people, you know, a buzz about that. So I've, you know, converted a few of my fan pages over. It looks fine. It's no big deal, you know. <laughs> uh, and yeah, they're supposed to be coming out with a new messaging system. Um, again, I, I, in my opinion, this is just me. Um, I see Facebook as kind of becoming very mainstream. Um, people are figuring out lots of creative ways to use it to communicate. But we're kind of in that, hey, let's kind of figure out how to make a practical um, kind of phase of the graph. And we're no longer in the overhype phase. We're, we're kind of settling into, you know, it's part of our daily lives. Let's figure out how to integrate it into sensible marketing practices. Okay. And, and then um, what do you think of the new Facebook um, fan page system now? Um, again, it's fine. I don't think the whole... It's a major change. Um, I'm glad it didn't break welcome pages. We have some uh, landing pages that we built, um, like like welcome tabs for some of our clients, and it didn't break that, so I was happy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I don't see a whole lot of pros and cons. It's just different. Um, I actually haven't messed with it too much. It's very new, and I've just converted a few pages over and kind of looked at the layout, and um, I don't see a whole lot of difference, really. Um, I might explore a bit further, but uh, so far... What's about saying to me? And what do you think that, what do you see the next big thing is in the technology world? Uh, this, mobile. Um, I think uh, a, lot of, a lot more people are going to be accessing um, the web and social networks on mobile devices. Um, I think it's probably um, being a little bit overhyped and a little bit exaggerated, but I think it's a very real trend. Um, I know a lot of people that hardly ever, um, you know, log into their computer. They, they basically do everything on their phone, email, Facebook, everything. Um, you know, they do banking and event registration and stuff like that on their computer, but um, they do everything else on their phone. So we're seeing a lot more demand for mobile websites. So if you go spin web on your iPhone, you're going to see a mobile version. Uh, a lot of people, instead of going the app route, are actually creating a mobile website so that it will work on you know, Android phones, on iPhones, on Blackberries. And that's a much more cost-effective way to um, create a mobile presence over as opposed to an app. So I think um, in a couple of years, if you don't have a mobile version of your website, you're going to be um, at a disadvantage. I myself um, haven't really got, haven't really caught on to LinkedIn yet. I um, haven't really marketed much with that or done much with that. Do you see a lot of the public um, starting to latch on to LinkedIn to get more popular now? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn is getting a little more uh, attention these days. Uh, my theory is people are sick of Facebook and looking for something new. That's just my theory. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. um, but uh, yeah, LinkedIn is a very cool network. It's um, it's all business, um, so it's kind of it's more comfortable to some people, and um, people are realizing that uh, it's gradually, I think, replacing the resume. This is just my soapbox, as some of you know. Um, you know, I think resumes are dead and stupid. And, uh, you know, when we interview people for a job, we don't want their resume. We look at their LinkedIn profile. And so a lot of job seekers especially are realizing that. And they're not worrying so much about just creating this document, you know, that's kind of useless called a resume. They're actually putting more effort into, you know, getting recommendations, to filling out their profile, to demonstrating expertise with their writing and their presentations and linking that into their profile. So I am seeing a lot more activity on LinkedIn. And uh, I've been asked to do a couple of presentations recently on LinkedIn uh, which is new. People haven't asked for that in the past. And, and with LinkedIn, I've been getting a lot of requests of people I've never even heard of or don't even know and stuff. Is that common too now? Yeah. Um, you do get some LinkedIn spam occasionally because some people are just kind of using it to try to cold call, so to speak. Um, so if it's someone that doesn't look legit or looks kind of sketchy and I don't know at all, I'm probably going to send a message back and say, hey, you know, thanks for the request. Tell me about yourself first and then maybe I'll connect. Um, if it's someone that looks legitimate, um, or I know what their company does, or who they are, or kind of heard of them, then I'll, I'll probably connect. And then somebody in the chat asked, uh, why is the youth market media uh, usage so studied? What about the older population? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I honestly don't know. I'm sure there are plenty of studies um, in lots of different uh, age groups. Um, in fact, I do remember a study from Jacob Nielsen on the, the boomer generation, for example, and their buying habits. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think there are studies out there. Um, I think a lot of people are just kind of obsessed with the next thing and the future and what's up and coming. And so, you know, they see, oh, well, let's study the 20-year-olds because in 10 years they're going to be, you know, the, the big buyers uh, of tomorrow. So I think a lot of people are just kind of trying to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, that's my theory. 
Do you think most massage therapists are online now? or Because um, I've heard some studies that maybe three-fourths of them are, if that, and stuff, and especially the older population isn't really connected much on the Internet. I've noticed that. Um, in my volunteer work with the AMTA Indiana chapter, I found that we have a lot of members, actually, that don't have email, which just shocks me to no end, but it's, it's true. Um, you know, they try to register for our events and they call us and we have to do it for them with our own email addresses because they don't have an email because, you know, you, these days if you register online, you've got to have an email address and they can't do it. Um, so yeah, we occasionally do get people that have, don't even have email and, you know, a lot of people, maybe they have email, but they're not on Facebook. They don't know what Twitter is. They, they're not on LinkedIn. Um, if they're going to be on something, they're going to be on Facebook, but we still have a lot of people that, you know, aren't even there. So the massage community does uh, seem from, to be slower to adopt uh, new technology, from what I can tell. And then somebody in the chat asks, um, but who is the biggest buyers of massage, and how are they related to social media? Who are the biggest buyers of massage, and how are they related to social media? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure who the biggest buyers of massage are. Um, I know a lot of athletes um, get massage. Um, but uh, as far as who the biggest buyers, I actually wouldn't know. Um, I'd have to find some data on that. Um, it, I think it depends as well on location, um, you know, on uh, vertical market that you serve, on your expertise. Um, obviously, some massage therapists specialize in techniques that uh, are aligned with runners or with golfers or with tennis players or with Olympians. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors in play, so it's hard to answer that question, really. Um, so that's the best I can do. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what's this whole thing with you and ninjas? Ninjas? Yep. We look like ninjas. Oh, I, I <laughs> from the office. Um, yeah, we actually. Uh, it's based, based on uh, a presentation I do called Inbox Zero: How to Become an Email Ninja. Um, and so it kind of spawned from there. We actually have these little uh, uh, stress ball toys in the shape of ninjas, and they have our logo on the back. And so when I do that presentation. Um, I, I give out these ninjas to people, and they love them. They have so much fun because I'm like, hey, if you get mad at your email and you get stressed out, just take a ninja and just squeeze it or throw it at your computer. <laughs> and they have to blast. And, so, um, and we also, uh, two of our employees have the title of Web Ninja. Um, they're the ones that actually do the coding and the build out of the website, kind of the behind the scenes technical work. Um, so, you know, ninja is just kind of a fun term that people use to uh, signify someone that's um, kind of in a, a zen state of, of uh, competence in some particular skill or area. So, uh, um, you know, we hope that applies to our, our talented employees. And, uh, and also, if you're a, an email ninja, that means you've uh, um, got a productivity system that works for you and you can manage your email really well. So that's why I call it how to become an email ninja when I, when I present that, uh, that system as well. So. <laughs> and you do, it fun. Yeah, and you do webinars, right, too, and stuff? I do, yeah. yeah. And, got one coming up in March, actually. And what is that on? Uh, it's on blogging for uh, SEO and social media. So okay. it's, uh, I believe it's March 2nd or 3rd. If you go to spinweb.net, it'll be listed there. Okay. And then somebody in the chat asked, um, if an MT is not a techie, um, can, they, um, can, can they buy help in the social media marketing? Uh, yes. Um, I know people that uh, will provide consulting uh, on social media. Um, I'm one of them. I know a lot of uh, uh, people that uh, I trust, friends of mine, that do that as well. Um, excuse me. There are lots of online resources as well. We have a learning center at SpinWeb that's free. If you go to spinweb.net slash learning, you can create a free account. And there's lots of tutorials that will teach you how to, for example, run an ad on Facebook or you know, use Twitter for, for business, stuff like that. So there's lots of free resources. My favorite is simply going to Google and saying, typing a question. So for example, you know, if you want to get articles on, you know, how to market on Facebook, for example, that's kind of generic, but you could type in, you know, how to market on Facebook and Google, and you'll get a ton of articles and videos also that teach you how to do what you're asking for. So my favorite technique is simply go to Google, type in your question in plain English, and, and do some research. Uh, but as far as asking for help, uh, yeah, there are lots of people that, um, that are willing to help. Um, there are some reputable companies that can give you uh, advice and consulting and, and platforms to do it. Um, if anyone would like to, you know, send me a question with more specific kind of needs, I'll be happy to try to connect uh, that person with the right resource as well. Okay. And when do you think Apple and Flash, um, Adobe, are going to get along? Never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Flash is dying, if not dead, in my opinion. Um, it's it's bloated. It's um, it's just uh, resource heavy. It's um, it's not necessary anymore. So I think Flash's days are numbered, if not pretty much um, are already gone. So I don't see Flash uh, really having a future at all, uh, especially with HTML5 uh, coming into play. It can do basically the same things as Flash um, at about twenty percent of the resources. So. There's no reason for Flash. <laughs> do you think YouTube? Right. Do you think YouTube will ever change them because they're Flash based? Um, actually, I can play YouTube videos on my iPhone and my iPad, so um, yeah, I think we, they've already taken care of that. Yeah, because we have the special application. That's the only reason why. But um, you, 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 you don't see them changing, or I could be wrong. I thought I recall actually viewing a, a YouTube video on the web um, on my iPad. Oh, you did. Yeah, I think you can do it. Unless I'm mistaken or, or on crack or something, I think you can do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and for websites, um, how long? How many pages do you think an uh, average person should have? Um, again, the whole uh, the the generic answer is always it depends. Um, so I really don't think there's a right or wrong. Uh, I think a lot of companies, especially small businesses, will make the mistake of having too many pages or too much content, uh, or rather, let me take that back, uh, content that is too in your face and too hard to navigate. So it's not so much a matter of how many pages you have, it's how your site navigation is structured. Uh, for example, if you go to spinweb.net, uh, you know, we have uh, very few top-level navigation choices. I think we have like five. Um, but underneath those options, we have uh, submenus that let you drill down to specific pieces of content if you want to get there. But we, we cover the main topics in like, you know, five options. Um, and so we have lots and lots of content. Our blog has like 200 articles in it. Uh, our press releases, you know, um, 50, 60 articles. Uh, lots of content, but it's in a specific path that doesn't overwhelm you. It lets you uh, take a logical path to get there. So, again, no right or wrong. It just depends on how you want to structure your content and how you want to guide people through your website to a call to action. And how long? Make, yeah. And how long does it usually take to make a website? Would you say from scratch? Um, again, it depends. Sorry for the guess. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it takes us about uh, eight to twelve weeks on average. Uh, most of our clients are, um, you know, businesses with five or more employees, so uh, they're a little bit bigger. Um, than a solo uh, entrepreneur, for example. Um, a smaller site, uh, especially if it's someone that works in WordPress, can be a couple weeks maybe, three weeks or so. Uh, it just really depends. Um, size of business has a lot to do with it, which will kind of dictate your needs. And then um, you, you guys have graphic designers, right, on your on your staff? And yeah. Do they design logos and everything else too then? Uh, we used to, but we found that... Um, Branding and identity work was a whole different context, and in order to be good at it, we would have to uh, split our time between that context and the web context. And so we stopped doing logos. We do strictly uh, website design and online marketing activities. Um, so we refer our logo and identity work out to other firms that we trust to do a good job, and they, they take care of our clients when it comes to branding and logo work. And, and then we can take that logo and that, that branding work and, and use it on the web effectively. So, so no, we don't do logos anymore. Uh, we just stick to the web. And then Radchick uh, asked, what about um, dealing with those horrible Google ads? <laughs> <laughs> what, what does dealing with them mean? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's just, just what she said. She said, uh, yuck. <laughs> I'm going to assume, since she said yuck, I'm, I'm assuming she means uh, viewing them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, when you search Google, um, for those who uh, don't know what we're referring to, at the top and the side, I think to the viewers it'll be this way, um, you'll see paid advertisements. Um, and those are uh, people that have paid for a listing on Google, and they get a special little text ad that pops up uh, based on keywords people search on. Um, that's just a fact of using Google. It's how they make money, or one of the ways they make money. Um, so there are certain browsers you can use to turn those ads off. Um, I think Firefox has a plugin that will let you turn off AdWords so you only see the organic listings in the middle. So if you really want them to go away, you can download a plugin. Um, I, I don't do that; it doesn't bother me. But um, if that person has a more specific uh, question about it, um, I'd love to hear more.
Yeah, and the person says um, some MTs um, advertise adding those to your website. Oh, so, yeah. okay, that's AdSense. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's kind of. I, I don't like AdSense. Yeah. <laughs> um, AdSense is uh, there are ads that if you run a website, you can um, basically let Google place ads on your website and get paid every time someone clicks on those ads. Um, I rarely see people make a whole lot of money from it, and I think it junks up your website. Um, especially if you're subscribing to a free service. Um, I've personally never used AMTA's uh, website service, but from what I understand, if you subscribe to the free version, they put uh, Google Ads on your site. I could be wrong, so if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong someone correct me, but I think that's how it works. Um, which means that, of course, you've got ads running on your site. I think it looks junky. Um, so, you know, you get what you pay for. If you're going to get something free or cheap, um, that may come with it. Okay. And how... What what's in a brand? Would you say? What's in a brand? Yeah. Um, the best definition I've seen of a brand is a brand is how other people perceive your company. Um, a lot of people think a brand is a logo. Uh, actually, um, a logo is part of your identity. A brand is actually the promise that you um, make or convey to constituents. So a brand is <clears throat> made up of you know how you answer the phone, how people talk about you. Uh, your tagline, uh, your customer service, everything that goes into the essence of, of how you provide service. Okay. And then um, taglines, um, do you think those are beneficial? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can be. Um, I, I mean, I like, I, like slogans and stuff like that. And I think uh, no tagline is better than a bad tagline. Okay. <laughs> lots of bad taglines. <laughs> Yours is bad. I say it's better not to use one at all. <laughs> but there's some good ones too. So um, I think a lot of people try to make really clever taglines that don't necessarily come off to the public as they were intended. And I don't know. I, um, a good tagline is typically very short, very simple, um, and that captures the essence of what you do. I'm not saying that you know I'm an expert at taglines by any sense because there's whole companies that charge you you know fifty thousand dollars just to make a tagline. Um, you know, they work for people like Nike, <clears throat> but, um, you know, our tagline is smart, simple solutions at SpinWeb. Um, our tagline doesn't say anything about the web because that is kind of, that just happens to be what we do. But the essence of our company is that we provide solutions that we think are smart uh, and that are simple. And what that means is, you know, we don't, um, introduce unnecessary complexity. Uh, we find the best, most productive, most useful path to getting where you want to be using the most sensible tools that we know of. And so that's where we come up with uh, smart, simple solutions. Now that could apply to, you know, whether we're working on the web, whether we're doing something else, whether it's, you know, selling shoes, whatever it might be. Um, the tagline doesn't have to apply, and it many times shouldn't apply to the specific product. It should apply to the essence of your company and the philosophies that are behind it. Okay. Is that for touchy feeling? Yep. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> And then you're also, your company kind of advertises marketing. Uh, what kind of things do you get into with marketing? Mm -hmm. uh, we do things like ghost blogging. We do things like uh, email campaigns. We do things like uh, consulting. Uh, you know, I'm working with some clients on ghost blogging where they're going to, where they hire us to uh, write periodic blogs and produce those for their websites. Uh, so it's content marketing. Uh, we do email campaigns for other clients on a periodic basis. Uh, I provide consulting for some clients where, you know, they want to do basically everything themselves, but they want coaching on best practices. And so I work with them to develop a marketing system and, you know, kind of a, a process for using their tools effectively uh, to generate leads and to test and, and measure. And do people usually hire your company like independent contractor kind of base or... How does that work then? Uh, we're an S corp, so we're a corporation. So uh, when they work with us, um, you know, we invoice. Um, so we're um, they would work with us just like uh, well, we, when you say work with, do you mean like one of our clients or employees that work at our company? Employees. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, we're all uh, W two employees. We pay a, a regular salary. It's uh, uh, we do everything in house. Um, I'm not a big fan of independent contractor. Um, you know, it works well for some businesses. I think. But, um, you know, we like to have a, a loyal base of, uh, of employees that are kind of part of the family. So everyone's a full-time uh, W-2 salaried employee. Okay. And what other kind of things do, does your company get involved in? Um, 
We do a lot of uh, community work and community service. Actually, we uh, last year we donated, uh, I think, over three thousand dollars to uh, local uh, nonprofits in our community that were um, doing fundraising. Um, I personally do a lot of speaking. Uh, other people on the company do some speaking as well. So you know, we'll speak at conferences and events. Uh, we'll do teaching, educational workshops. Um, we do a lot of uh, networking in the community. Uh, I serve on a lot of committees for. Um, some associations uh, local to, to my city as well, uh, helping plan conventions and recruit new members, stuff like that. So we try to be as involved in our community as possible. Uh, we've been really blessed with um, you know uh, a, a lot of uh, great clients, uh, good business, very strong business. So we do whatever we can to help others, uh, whether it's mentoring, um, you know, young. Uh, Technical people, young web designers, young programmers that want advice on the job market, whether it's a local nonprofit that needs some help fundraising, uh, whatever it may be, we're, we're looking for ways to give back as much as possible. Okay. And how do you determine the speed of a website um, for loading wise? Um, what's slow and what's fast? And uh, sure, we uh, we code in, um, uh, in in such a way that it's as as few lines of code as possible and as lean as possible. So. Um, in general, if your website is coded well using modern uh, HTML and CSS uh, kind of practices, it's going to load fine. Your web server has a lot to do with it as well. Um, so if you pay for cheap web hosting, it's probably going to be slower. If you pay for you know decent quality web hosting, it's going to be faster. You kind of get what you pay for. So um, you know a couple seconds is generally the limit. If it's any longer than that to load, people are going to uh, get frustrated. And then somebody in the chat, um, chat asked, do you think iPad will ever have USB ports? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think so, actually. Apple seems to have a trend of killing off physical media uh, really early, which I like. I think it's kind of cool. Um, you know, they were the first to eliminate the floppy drive. And now with uh, the MacBook Air, they eliminate the CD-ROM drive, for example. Um, everything's pretty much going cloud-based, which means it's all networked and uh, based on servers and the Internet. So I'm not sure there's really a need for a USB port on an iPad because, uh, again, everything is so cloud-based. You can pull up files from, from servers. It's all uh, over Wi-Fi. So uh, I predict no. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but uh, my prediction is no. <laughs> <laughs> and is there any good um, application for Facebook on, for the iPad or the iPhone? Because I've tried uh, some, and I, I don't like them. Uh, is there any good application? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everyone hates the Facebook app for iPhone, but it's the only one out there, I think. Um, and the iPad doesn't have an app, but that's because the iPad uh, renders websites normally. So uh, the Facebook site on iPad renders just fine, so I don't think there's a need for it. Okay. And then somebody asked, does the adapter for the USB port, does it uh, allow hooking up to a printer at all? The adapter on the iPad? Yeah. So uh, it's a little... This port yeah. The bottom? You know, there's a little uh, adapter that you can use for um, USB, I know, and stuff, so I got that. Um, you know what? I don't know. I print things so rarely that I don't know, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, the new operating system on the iPad does let you pull up a document, and you can then click print on it and uh, print wirelessly to your wireless printer. So you can do that. Okay. And why do you think um, so many massage therapists don't have websites? Um... I always ask myself that question. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, I think whatever, um, I guess my theory is whatever makes massage therapists really good at the personal connection um, and, and the work they do and the, the healing part of what they do, I think whatever makes them really good at that um, kind of comes with a little bit of apprehension when it comes to technology and that part of the brain. I'm, I'm just totally making this up. I, I, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. But that's my theory. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, I think there's maybe just some kind of uh, some kind of relation there. Um, I notice a lot of massage therapists that um, they're just kind of fearful. They just kind of have some anxiety about trying trying new things in technology. They're afraid that it's um, too difficult. Maybe um, I'm not sure what it is honestly. Now I know some massage therapists that just jump right in and have fun with it. So, um, but the massage community in general seems to be a little bit slower to adopt technology. So, you know, I actually love working with the massage community because. You know, I, I like finding ways to make it more approachable and uh, and more uh, understandable uh, to people that might otherwise be scared of it. 
And is there any web um, website uh, development um, programs out there that are more easier user friendly? Um, the standard is still um, well. I shouldn't say this anymore. I, the standard used to be Dreamweaver, but uh, a lot of um, professional designers are getting away from Dreamweaver again, just kind of coding by hand. Um, so I would say Dreamweaver still is viable if you want to uh, not really look at code too much and just kind of put something together. Um, you know, Apple's got a product called iWeb also that uh, makes it a little bit easier to build a website. It's not going to do a whole lot for you, but you can build one pretty easily. Um, WordPress.com lets you launch a site pretty easily as well. Uh, so there are a few options. Yeah. And do you think people should have um, dashes in their web their domain name at all? Uh, no. Um, I think dashes are. Um, I mean, they don't hurt anything, but. You know, when you're giving out a domain name or putting it in print, it's just awkward to have a dash in it. So I would avoid it if possible. Okay. And um, what do you think of those people that sit on domains? <laughs> um, I think they have every right to do that. They can be annoying if you're the one trying to buy the domain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, um, I think it was maybe three years ago, uh, approximately, um, I bought MichaelReynolds.com for $1,000. Um, someone was just sitting on it doing nothing, and I emailed the guy, and I was like, hey, I'd like to have that domain, because I'm going to use it for, you know, speaking and blogging, all this stuff, and he's like, yeah, I actually was going to use it, too, so name a price, so I, you know, I named a price, you know, he's like, ah, eh, name something higher, so we kind of eventually got up to, I was like, dude, just take $1,000, like, are you going to give it to me, and he's like, oh, okay, um, so yeah, I bought it, and it was annoying, but, you know, it was worth it, he had it, uh, he owned it, he had every right to charge money for it, and you know, it was worth it to me because I, you know, plan to use it for promoting myself as a speaker, as a blogger, as a consultant. So it was worth it. It was a, it was a sensible buy for me. Um, so I don't think they're bad people. I think that if you, you know, grab that piece of real estate, so to speak, and you want to charge money for it, it's the free market. So how about it? <laughs> yeah. And do you think, um, let's say somebody, let, let's say for um, SpinWeb, do you think you should buy the .org, the .net, the .everything then? Um, not necessarily. We have the .net and the .com and the .us, I believe. Um, that's enough. Um, it's not that important to have all of them, I think. Um, I mean, if you're maybe a huge brand uh, and you want to protect all aspects of it, then yeah, it makes sense. But in general, if you get one version, you're probably good to go. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay. <laughs> and what do you think is um, acceptable to pay for domain hosting a year? Uh, for domain registration, yeah, um, ten bucks a year, twenty bucks a year. Uh, GoDaddy charges ten bucks a year on average. Uh, Network Solutions, I think, is twenty or twenty-five. Um, you know, we charge twenty-five at SpinWeb, and we resell through another company. Um, you know, they're pretty market price is pretty pretty consistent. So, ten twenty-ish per year. And I know Yahoo. I mean, it's like close to forty now. It's just rid ridiculous. So. Uh, that's just for the domain, yeah. Are you, yeah. Are you referring to hosting as well? No, just for the domain, yeah. That's domain. That's pretty average. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, is there anything that we did not cover, do you think, that you need to let the community know? Um, let's see. I'm thinking. I'm trying to think of that list that we uh, talked about earlier. I think yeah. we've covered quite a bit, actually. Um, I, uh, I think probably the most important thing that I, I like to stress is permission marketing and, and kind of value-driven content marketing. So, you know, the same things we talked about in blogging uh, apply to email. You know, we didn't talk about email marketing a whole lot, but, you know, I see lots of really spammy email newsletters that basically promote and sell and shout. Um, the really successful email newsletters that generate loyalty and build a good subscriber base are the ones that have very simple content, maybe one single message, that give value and teach and, and provide something useful. Um, so the same principles in blogging, I think, apply to email marketing as well and to really your, your social activity in general. So um, I think everyone that does any kind of marketing uh, should read Permission Marketing by Seth Godin. Uh, it's a fantastic book. It's kind of old, but the principles still apply in full force today. So um, anyone who's thinking about marketing on social media, blogging, doing email marketing, uh, do yourself a favor, get a copy of Permission Marketing by Seth Godin, read it cover to cover, and that'll, uh, I think, be very helpful in how you approach uh, online marketing. And then somebody in the chat asked, uh, what is relationship marketing? Um, 
in my opinion, it's very similar to what we already talked about. I think relationship mm -hmm. marketing is uh, building loyalty with your constituents um, through a slow uh, process of, of content and, and knowledge and, and trust. So I would say relationship marketing is kind of the same thing as permission marketing. And how do you spell the person's name? Seth, um, what? Uh, Godin, G-O-D-I-N. Okay, somebody in the chat wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah. And I've seen... Um, you, uh, Angela Palmer, I think, will sh you know, share that information. <laughs> Alyssa, too. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so is, have you met him in person yet? I have not. Um, I've heard a rumor that uh, that Alyssa has, though. You may ask her about that. Okay. 